In previous videos, I have had several people comment that they had Greek mythological elements already embedded in their D&D campaigns, and I want to be part of it. Welcome or welcome back. On this channel, I'd like to talk about D&D, specifically the Feywild, but to be honest, almost everything I talk about could be translated to pretty much any game. I love to use histories and mythologies and folklores to add flavor and interest to these D&D worlds, and today I'm going to be talking about Greek mythology, specifically pulling from the book Metamorphosis by Ovid. Ovid's epic poem, whose theme of change has resonated throughout the ages, is one of the most important texts of Western imagination, an inspiration from Dante's time to the present day, and today it's going to inspire d and This video is going to sort of be in two parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about Archfey or gods in d and and pull some inspiration from this book. And then the other part, I'm going to pull perhaps some specific encounters or maybe some NPCs. I'm mostly going to tell you about certain parts of this book that I think have really good details or interesting stories, and then I might suggest a way to adapt it, but a lot of that is kind of up to you and your setting, so I'm not going to be too specific. And a final note before I get started, Metamorphosis, as well as a lot of older literature, has a lot of mentions of sexual assault, so I'm going to not focus too heavily on that subject, but it's pretty much inherent in most of these tales. So if that's a sensitive topic for you, just letting you know we're gonna touch on it here and there. First, I wanna talk about some Greek gods that I think could make really good D&D gods and or Archfey. I'm not going to talk about Zeus, Poseidon, Hades. I feel like those big names are really easy and we see figures like that anywhere. Even figures like Aphrodite I've talked about in the past to sort of compare to other Archfey that are already known in the D&D canon like Veronestra. But there are some others that are fairly well known that I think you could implement in a more specific way like Cupid. Cupid is not a cute little baby with a bow and arrow with a little heart at the end, although he does have a bow and arrow. He's a god. The beginning of Metamorphosis has a creation section, like how the Bible begins with the creation of the earth, and not long after that we get a scene of Apollo antagonizing Cupid is what he's doing. So in response, Cupid strikes him with one arrow and a woman with another. And these arrows have very different properties. And from his quiver drew two arrows out, which operated at cross purposes. For one engendered flight, the other love. The latter has a polished tip of gold, the former has a tip of dull blunt lead. Apollo antagonized Cupid, so Cupid made him fall deeply in love with a human woman who is a entirely repelled by him. In the world of D&D Archfey, I think someone like Cupid would be fantastic. A little chaotic, and it has that charming element to Archfey that I just love to see. The story also maintains that chaotic, uncertain morality that you get with a lot of Archfey and Fey beings in general, because he's not trying to make the world better by making the right people fall in love. He was made fun of, and messed with people's affections. The next god I want to talk about is Bacchus. A lot of people know him as the god of wine and revelry. I think he was in the Percy Jackson series as like a punishment. He had to be a figure at a camp. It's been a long time since I've read the books, but people know him pretty well as being like the party god. I think we should be careful though, because just because someone's a god of party and revelry and like being out of your mind and there were the Bacchanalian rituals where people would enter a state of madness, the god is still dangerous. There's a story in Metamorphosis of Bacchus being disguised as a young boy who looks a bit girlish, and he is kidnapped by a sailor for very unsavory purposes. The sailor brings Bacchus unknowingly onto the ship, and one of the people who was on the ship who's actually writing this narrative knows that something's not right about this. What god impersonates that child, I do not know, but there's a god in him, I'm sure of that. Whoever you are, oh, show us grace and favor, aid our undertakings, and forgive these men for their offense. The men make fun of this one man and clearly intend to do harm to this child. Bacchus in this form even pretends for a moment to have been tricked and he's realizing the trick. I swear that what I tell you next is truth, though past belief. The ship stood still in the sea, as though it had been lifted up in dry dock. The men, although astounded, persevere, redoubling their strokes and letting sail out, hoping to break loose one way or another. 
but now the oars are tangled up in ivy. Entwining strands of it coil round their bodies, ascend the masts and decorate the sails with ivy berries in enormous clusters. And now the god reveals himself at last, his brow festooned with leaves and grapes and bunches, shaking a spear with vine leaves wrapped around it. About him, tigers in the bodiless forms of lynxes and fierce leopards lie. Insanity or terror drives my crew, and they leap overboard. Medan's whole body begins to darken, and his spine is molded in a dramatic curve. Vines and plants emerge on this ship. There's violence and madness all of a sudden. The only man who survives is the one who insisted that the little boy was a god and they should probably not hurt him. I like Bacchus as a god or especially an archfey, someone who appears innocent or looks like they could harm and perhaps that's the intent, seeing who will try to take advantage, not necessarily sexually, but take advantage of a young innocent creature. And when someone proves untrustworthy or violent, the sort of power that can make vines grow and conjure animals out of nothing. I mean, if that's not Archfey behavior, come on. The third and final goddess I want to talk about is fairly common. I know when I was young, I and all of my other friends who were in any way into the Percy Jackson series or knew anything about the Greek gods, she was our favorite, Diana. Virgin goddess of the woods, a huntress known for her wisdom. Of course, young girls trying to find their way in the world are going to love this goddess and what she stands for. And when I read Metamorphosis, and came across the first story that has her as a major player in it, I'll be honest, I was a little thrown off. What Greek gods and Archfey have in common is a morality of their own. One that is often centrally driven, that doesn't make sense with traditional views of right and wrong, and Diana is no exception. In this story, there's a man on a big hunting trip, and in the woods, he accidentally comes across Diana bathing. He immediately tries to get out of there. He didn't mean to see her naked, but it is too late. She throws droplets in his face and says, now you may tell of how you saw me naked. Tell it if you can, you may. No further warning. The brow which she had sprinkled jets the horns of a lively stag. She elongates his neck, narrows his ear tips down to tiny points. She turns him into a stag on a hunting trip. The hounds soon pick up his scent, chase after him. He is hunted down, and while he's being hunted, the other men in the party are looking for him, like, man, he should be in on this, and of course don't know that they're hunting him. And the really sick part, is that even when the hounds are tearing at him and the men are attacking, Diana keeps him alive until she decides he's suffered enough to die. This is why I only made it a quarter of the way through this book before I had plenty of content for a video. So if you want a part two, you want a little more metamorphosis, let me know. I can, easy, <laughs> easily done. And that last story gets us into the second part of this video, Metamorphosis. This poem is titled as such because the major theme of this work is change, metamorphosizing, whether it's because someone is being punished, whether they are changed by their own grief, whether they asked to be changed for some reason, or in one case, whether they found a way to control the change. Metamorphosis is all about metamorphosis, and we see this in modern text. One of the last videos I made was on Stardust by Neil Gaiman, and at one point in the book, the main character comes across a tree who speaks, and the tree used to be a woman who I think as punishment for something was turned into a tree. That's that's in here, textbook. In the original text, unfortunately, a lot of these changes are the result of sexual assault, and it's generally happening to the victims, whether they're trying to escape assault and being rescued by being turned into a tree, or they've been assaulted, another god is mad at them for being assaulted, and punishes them by turning them into something. I want to emphasize again, this is a beautiful poem, but it is chock full of victim blaming and attack, and it can be hard to read at times, so I'm just gonna throw that out there one more time. It is uncomfortable and frustrating, and the poem is beautiful, but it was written in a very different time than we are in now. Sometimes metamorphosis doesn't happen as a result of a god punishing someone though. In one instance, a man loses someone he loves 
His voice becomes attenuated, and white feathers grow over the hair upon his face and body. A lengthy neck extends far from his chest, a membrane starts between his reddish toes, wings hide his sides, and a blunt bill his mouth. A god does not turn him into a bird, but his grief overtakes him and something magical happens. These changes when people are turned into birds or plants are often sort of the Greek versions of creation stories, how something came to be. I'm gonna give a few more examples for you to tinker with, use, see if you can fit into your story somehow, but in general, any sort of transformation is a little chaotic. And I, I highly recommend putting something like this in the Feywild. Even in Stardust, our main character gets turned into a mouse at some point. It's just part of the weird, magical, unpredictable nature of a place like that. There's one story I find really interesting called The Judgment of Tiresias, who having once profaned the coupling of two enormous serpents, uh, gives them a blow with his walking stick. And when he does so, his sex changes. He's turned into a woman for seven years, and on the eighth year, he finds these snakes again and has the idea to give him another whack, turns back. He has some control over this. But his story is far from over at that point, because another couple is arguing about whether it is more enjoyable, wink wink, to be a man or a woman in certain circumstances and he gives an answer. Specifically, the couple he's talking to is Zeus and Hera, or Jove and Juno, gods. So that was dangerous to give an answer because he agrees with Jove. And Saturn's daughter reacted badly when he gave his judgment, and many thought her anger was excessive when, for an issue of no great importance, she damned Tiresias to eternal blindness. But one god can't undo another's doing, and so Jove gave Tiresias the gift of foresight, to replace the vision lost, tempering punishment with the high esteem he was soon held in throughout all of Boeotia for the unerring answers that he gave to those who came to him and sought his counsel. One detail in there that I really like as well, one being's actions can't be undone by another. How interesting if you have an archfey or a god in D&D and they can punish or reward the party in some way, and if they like or don't like it, and they come across another archfey, that archfey cannot undo what's been done. Only the original can. I just think that would be a really interesting way of handling certain conflicts, adding another little conundrum in there. Something like the wish spell could maybe undo it, but honestly, that's up to you. I also forgot in my notes, I have a criminal who was turned into stone. Also classic. I also want to talk about Narcissus because we know the story of the man who's looking into a pool of water who is so transfixed by his beauty that he can't look away. Here's a little more context for that. Narcissus was always a beautiful man, and the nymph called Echo, who echoes everything that he says when she's chasing him down in the forest, has been spurned by him. He trifled with her and so many others, water nymphs, nymphs of the wooded mountains, as well as a host of male admirers, one of those spurned, raised his hands to heaven. May he himself love as I have loved him, he said, without obtaining his beloved. And Nemesis assented to his prayer. He's effectively cursed and it's tormenting to him to look upon this reflection of this being that he can never have, but it is right there. He stays there until his grief kills him. But after they'd arranged his funeral, gotten the logs, the beer, the brandished torches, the boy's remains were nowhere to be found. Instead, a flower, whose white petals fit closely around a saffron-colored center. And thus the creation story of the Narcissus flower, and another way I think you could implement change in the Feywild post-death. The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, which I'm running right now, has a chart for death in the Feywild and the physical effects that can happen when an NPC or a party member dies. A body could turn to stone, it could rapidly start aging, or it could spring back with one HP. I'm interested in having an expanded version of that chart because let's say that one of your party members dies in combat, turn them into a flower, turn them into something that is still technically living, but is a plant or like some physical object. And then the party has to kind of make the decision, can we bring this person back? And it's up to you. 
can they? Let me wrap this up by reading a few lines about different stories that could be told of metamorphosis. A woman who, as Syria supposes, was changed into a scaly thing that swims now in a little pool. Or how her daughter, transformed into a dove of purest white, spent her last years perched on lofty towers. Or how, by potent herbs and incantations, a nymph changed little boys to fish until she went underwent the same conversion. Or how the mulberry, which once bore white, bears dark fruit now since it's been stained with blood. That one will please them with its novelty, and as she weaves, begins to spin her yarn." That is as far as I made it through this book when prepping for this video, and it is rich with ideas for change and chaos and magic and very questionable morality. Greek mythology is ripe with Feywild material. And of course it has all sorts of other cultural value and it's a beautiful text and it's historical, but we're being selfish here. We're using it for Dungeons and Dragons. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Down below, let me know any ideas that you thought were particularly inspiring, maybe some Greek mythology elements that you've already incorporated into your D&D world. I would love to hear it. And of course, like and subscribe and like algorithm stuff. But that is all I have for you today. So I hope you have a great whatever it is and I will see you next time.